Okay, the, the title of my, my talk today is The Same, Only Different. When, in 1990, the audience at the Richard Rogers Theater in New York attended Accomplice, a new play by Rupert Holmes, billed as a comedy thriller, that term was well established as, described, as describing a particular form of late 20th century mystery drama based on a traditional detective story play, but with a significant element of dark humor, dramatic tricks, and disguises. The popular Broadway successes Sleuth in 1970, Death Trap in 1978, had both been made into successful films and established this subgenre, which remained popular in New York for the rest of the century. The program promised a setting very similar to those of these two model works, an upper class living room, here I quote, Dorping Mill, the renovated moorland residence of Derek and Kat Taylor, unquote, and the curtain open to reveal an elegant, if somewhat rustic interior, full of the scenic detail of most such dramas. The action began when an actor, apparently the man of the house, returning home from work, enters the front door, removes his coat and hat, and goes to a small side table where he mixes himself a drink. All of this pantomime seems perfectly normal until the actor turns to the audience and speaks to them the opening lines of the play, which are, I quote, that's exactly how all these plays began, isn't it? Dorping Mill, the renovated Moorland residence of Derek and Janet Taylor, unquote. And then he goes on to repeat exactly the opening stage directions from the script, which he has just performed. There are, of course, many of such surprises, but I want to stop here and ask a basic analytical question. What is the trick here, and why does it work, since the answer leads directly into the phenomenon I want to discuss today? In order for this sequence to have its proper surprise effect, the author must make certain critical assumptions about his audience, and that is that they have seen enough plays like Accomplice to immediately recognize the conventions of that genre. Note the opening appeal to this knowledge, quote, that's exactly how all these plays began, isn't it? Of course, all these plays does not include Hamlet or Tartu or Medea, even The Doll's House or Death of a Salesman, but only plays of a very particular type, including the well-known Sleuth and Death Trap. And Holmes, the author, assumes that all or most of the audience would immediately understand this with no more specific reference than to these plays. Why can he assume this? The answer involves a kind of paradox in the nature of theater audiences, and indeed of audiences to most events. While in theory an audience can be composed of a quite random collection of individuals, in fact, this is never the case. While we cannot predict the background of any particular audience member, we can assume a number of things about any audience in general. Among these, the most important is the great majority of any are, experience, are experienced in whatever sort of event they are attending. Central to one's understanding and appreciation of any of these experiences is the memory of previous experiences placed in juxtaposition with the new. What we are describing here is a basic operation of cognition, not only in the arts, but in all human experience. Memory and understanding are inseparable, and many of the activities were, which we consciously pursue, such as artistic experiences, we select because we can take with us to them an already accumulated repertoire of memories of similar events that we can use in understanding 
and appreciating the new experience. What I want to discuss today is how this universal dynamic of cognition, experience, and memory operates in theater in a manner substantially different from how it operates in other human activities, even in the other arts, due to certain unique features of theater itself as a human activity. Let us go back again to the unconventional opening of Accomplice, which I would argue is a uniquely theatrical experience. Imagine, for example, that as an audience, we are seated not in a Broadway theater, but in some major concert venue, like the nearby Carnegie Hall. We are gathered to hear the premiere of a symphony, but one which we have been led to expect follows an established style, say, that of Beethoven. The orchestra begins the piece, clearly in that style, but a few measures into the work, the first violinist stops playing, as do his fellow musicians, and he steps directly to a forward to directly address the audience and says, I quote, that's exactly how all these symphonies begin, isn't it? Unquote. Even in the era of John Cage, such an occurrence remains quite unthinkable. How can New York audiences in a Broadway theater accept such a shift in perception, while equally sophisticated audiences a few blocks away would not accept a similar shift in a musical presentation? The answer lies in the particular relation to reality that the theater shares with no other art. Theater theorists, ever since the Greeks, have recognized the centrality of mimesis, the theater, and art based on imitation, but equally important, theater, unlike other arts, carries out this imitation using real elements, real bodies, imitating other bodies, real chairs, imitating other chairs, real clothing imitating other clothing. Central to the theater experience is the knowledge that even while we are pretending to believe in the reality of the character Hamlet, we are also aware on some level that what we are watching is a living human being who is not Hamlet at all, but may often be an actor we know in other roles. This is why throughout theater history, Actors have been able to step out of their stage surroundings and speak to the audiences directly without destroying the theater experience. In an attempt to clarify these multiple positions, semiotic theorists sometimes spoke of three different ways that an actor in theater was experienced. As actor, that is, as the actor individual, as the actual individual, say John Gielgud, performs a role as character, say Hamlet, the person created by Shakespeare, and as stage figure, in this case the particular embodiment of Hamlet created by Gilgood, which is both different from any other actor's Hamlet, and also different from any other role played by Gilgood himself. Although we rarely think about these various levels of reality, unless the performance calls attention to them, they are always part of the experience, especially since, as I have already remarked, most members of any theater audience come with a memory of many previous theater experiences. If a well-known actor, like Neil Good, appears in a new staging of an often presented play like Hamlet, it is quite certain that most of the audience will watch the presentation while remembering not only other, other performances by this particular actor in other productions, but also other productions of this same play featuring other actors. When watching a play, we are always to some extent affected by memories of other plays which surround our current experiences like ghosts for that reason, I have called this inevitable part of the, re of the reception process in theater, ghosting. But every new presentation, to some degree, 
or other is haunted by such ghosts. Of all art forms, theater is particularly involved with this kind of experience for a number of reasons. First, the theater operates on a wide variety of levels, employing a wide variety of material and methodologies for its effects. Any of these offer the possibility of ghosting. Second, the theater is more devoted than other arts to reusing the same physical and non-physical materials in constantly changing combinations, always opening the possibility that these materials in new combinations still nevertheless carry memories of their previous use. As I have noted, this phenomenon is particularly clear in the case of actors, the most prominent element in the theater. But since the theater surrounds the actor with a wide variety of other objects, which, like the actor, can both occupy a place in the physical world outside the theater, and also trigger memories and associations in the mind of the audience by being used over and over again in the same production or in different productions. A particular object, a distinctive property, a chair, a costume, can, like an actor, evoke the ghosts of its previous appearances on stage and off. Professional theaters in New York are required by law not to reuse properties or costumes to protect the business of those who produce these objects. But in smaller theaters, and throughout most of theater history, theaters have kept large storehouses of such material and frequently used it in multiple productions. One of the leading experimental companies in the United States, the Wooster Group, has become especially associated with this dynamic, bringing back specific individual objects, like recurring properties, such as a distinctive red fly swatter in a variety of different productions, which nevertheless, have, which otherwise have little in common, but encouraging audiences to connect the productions together as different experiments by this particular company. The individual repeating element suggests a wide range of other repeated elements which profoundly condition the experience of an audience attending a production by the Wooster Group. The majority of the world's theater, past and present, traditional and experimental, has been created by more or less stable companies of actors, of which the Wooster Group is an important contemporary example. This arrangement is particularly encouraging to ghosting since repeating audiences, and most companies depend heavily on repeating audiences, will bring with them to new productions not only memories of individual actors, but of groups and relationships. If a French audience were attending a new play by Moliere in the 1660s, and the curtain rose on the actors La Grange and Mademoiselle de Broglie, not a word needed to be spoken before the audience knew by previous experience with these actors, this company, and this playwright that these were the two young lovers whose temporary separation and eventual union would be the subject of this comedy. The composition and operation of Moliere's company was representative of companies all over the Western world for the next two centuries and reflected a feature of Western theater that can be traced back at least to the Middle Ages and arguably to the classic era. Since Roman times, theater has been largely produced by more or less stable groups, companies of actors, often interrelated and as the theater became more literary, for whom a specific dramatist created new plays. Thus, in classic times, the Western theater established particular sets of character relationships, resulting in particular story structures that remained remarkably stable for centuries. Countless elements in the theater worked to reinforce this stability and the memories associated with it. Most notably, 
Each company consisted of stock characters who would play strikingly similar characters in play after play. The best known example of this is the Commedia dell'arte tradition, a strong influence on Moliere and others. Thus, Moliere's audience knew from the outset what sort of character the young lover, Lagrange, would play that evening, not only because of previous Moliere plays, but of comedies in general, which ever since the Romans have been concerned with the love affairs of young men much like Lagrange. A continual cycle was thus established. Audience ex audiences expected and dramatists created plays presenting certain actors in certain roles and relationships in play after play. And actors were hired for and became known for presenting a certain type of role, even when, in some cases, they grew far too old to realistically do so. In such cases, the power of the audience's memories of their past presentations could even overcome the clear visual evidence that they were no longer inexperienced young lovers. So well established was the association between actor and character type that Moliere often gave actors in quite different families the same first name, marking their character type, Valère for the young lovers played by Lagrange, Marianne for their eventual partners played by Du Bois. Names repeated from play to play is another way the theater has traditionally encouraged audience memories and the process of ghosting. This operates in a number of ways, each of which has been extensively used by the theater. Popular characters have always encouraged playwrights and audiences to bring them back in other situations, as Beaumarchais did with Figaro, as Queen Elizabeth famously asked Shakespeare to do with Falstaff. Once Conan Doyle's popular detective, Sherlock Holmes, made the transition from page to stage, he established himself there so solidly and continues today in new stories created for film and television. Often, such repeating characters come, as Sherlock does, with a whole surrounding world of places, properties, costumes, and other characters. The inevitable Watson, of course, but also Sherlock's brother, Mycroft, his faithful landlady, Mrs. Hudson, his arch enemy, Moriarty, and others. A character like Holmes, Figaro, or Falstaff can move into new adventures, carrying a whole imaginary world with him, a ghost surrounded by a ghosted but flexible world. Another sort of repeated characters carries with him not only related characters, but a specific series of actions that also, like ghosts, hover over any new interpretation. The most significant example of this is the countless plays based on mythology, one of the richest sources of theater stories in both the East and the West. So Antigone brings with her not only a cluster of related characters, Creon, Ismene, Hymen, Eurydice, even the soldiers, and in most cases, the chorus. The background of the story can change radically. In France, under German occupation, in Argentina during the Dirty Wars, in the Congo under Mobutu, but the relationships and the structure of action remains remarkably stable. Antigone defies Creon's prohibition against the burial of her brother and is condemned to death for her action despite her betrothal to Creon's son, Hymen. Hymen commits suicide, as does his grieving mother. Thus, a modern dramatic retelling of this story will, for most audiences, be haunted by the memories not only of various specific elements of the story itself, but also by memories of previous productions, not only of the Greek original, but of variations of it which continue to be created around the world. Repeating stories, repeating bodies, repeating characters, repeating actions, repeating physical objects, all of these are central to the particular way 
the theater tells its stories, and also the kind of stories it tells. Perhaps not surprisingly, we can extend these ghosts of the memory even to the places where we go to see theater, the places of performance themselves. I'll start again. Theaters are often literally haunted in popular fiction, but many older theaters are claimed to harbor ghosts of past actors and managers. But audiences contribute another sort of ghost by often revisiting the same theater. The memories of plays presented there and the experience of seeing them in that space makes its own contribution to audience experience, especially when the theater, as is often the case, becomes particularly associated with certain actors, certain authors, certain dramatic companies, such as Brecht's Berliner Ensemble, Moliere's Comédies, or the Wooster Group's Performing Garage. Thus, from the moment an audience enters a performance space, they are immersed in a world composed of many real and remembers of previous performances here and elsewhere. The more theater one attends, the richer becomes the interplay of new and remembered experience. Each new performance is different, and yet in important ways the same. And the combination of these two elements lies at the very heart of theatrical reception. Hope we got question is about the, the difference between Europe and Brazil, or United States and Brazil, where people go very often to the theater. Do you think that the experience of uh, ghosting happens in Brazil, even if the, the audiences are not uh, very, very frequent, very often at these, at the theaters? How, how can we imagine this in Brazil? I would say that you cannot have theater without ghosting. So every theater has ghosting. Uh, the, the, uh, this is, a, as I say, there's a kind of paradox that is, uh, it's true you say that you cannot predict any particular audience member but you can predict that most people who go to the theater and most of any audience will not be there for the first time and doesn't know what theater is. Um, how do they even know which way to look, which way the curtain is? Uh, they, already, they already have a lot of the codes and ideas in their mind. Um, if, uh, uh, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a new play, they still may know the name of, a, of an actor in it, or they may know uh, the author, they may know the kind of play, they may just like the things that are done at this theater. But uh, people usually don't go to the theater, almost always they don't go to the theater unless there's a particular reason, and that reason will be what they bring with them into the theater. And as soon as they do that, they set up ghosting. If you, uh, I, I, I think, it, of course, it's true that uh, somebody who has seen several hundred plays is going to have a, 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 a richer, denser, thicker, ghosting experience than somebody who has only seen a few plays. Uh, but uh, again, that's related to the fact that if you've, seen a, if you've heard a lot of music, you understand more and you appreciate more richly new music you hear if you heard a lot more. And that, that ghosting is related to that. But I, I, I really can hardly imagine uh, a theater that existed without ghosting. Uh, it just may be that the experience is, is uh, more complicated or richer in, in cultures where people go to the theater frequently, but, I, but the, the phenomenon is always there. I have two questions. One relates to the idea of sites of performance 
So you, if you are, uh, if the company is performing a play in a church or a place that's not, so how did, does ghosting uh, do with that? How does the idea of ghosting, if you have a new site of performance, such as a church, a place that's not generally used for theatre, so if the, the theatre piece that is being presented will be haunted by images uh, extra, other than those of the play, etc. And the other question has to do with the idea of the author, which, uh, uh, you know, I saw that you mentioned uh, scenery and, and clothing and props and audience, etc. But I was thinking about if the author, as T.S. Eliot thinks of uh, traditional individual talent, or even Harold Bloom, when he talks about the anxiety of influence, how you know, because Shakespeare, I think, was a haunted author. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the two questions separately. Uh, first, uh, any location uh, is haunted that that is occupied by human beings. This theater is haunted. Um, uh, the uh, uh, as as we were walking over here. Uh, through the through the park uh, near the military base, uh, uh, Evelyn said, "You know there, were, there was a revolution here in 1922. That's haunted. That space is haunted by that revolution. Uh, as whatever whatever whenever a human beings start living in a place, they start creating ghosts by memories of things that have happened in that place. Certain kinds of places." have certain kinds of haunting. Uh, obviously, any official building, uh, a church, of course, is haunted uh, by the, not only by what's happened in that church, but by what all churches have. I mean, it's haunted by a sense of what a church is. Uh, so that uh, when a theater moves out of the theater, uh, into another location, uh, in, we, the, the term is common in English, site-specific theater. Well, what is specific about it? It's specific because it is a specific place with its own memories. And those memories then are used, to a greater or lesser extent, by the director, the actors, the designer, and so on. Uh, so, you don't escape ghosting by moving out of the theater, it gets worse. <laughs> okay, now, uh, uh, about the ghosting of the author, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a big question, uh, and a theoretically complicated question. I'll try to give a brief answer. Uh, I guess the first thing I must say is that uh, the theater, much more than the novel, for example, is as a literary form is haunted. And by that I mean that the theater is full of things like Antigone or Eurydice or Medea uh, that have, or Phaedra that have many, many, many different versions of the same play. Even Hamlet, there are many, I, I mean new plays that are, there's a play called Hamlet in New York, for example. Now, that's very common in the theater, or three or four or five plays about the same character. That doesn't happen in the novel. That is, you don't have 25 or 60 different versions of Don Quixote, the way you have of Faust, say, or Don Juan. The, the, the theater likes to ghost itself, and authors like to ghost their plays. Uh, and we could go into why that is, but it's just a fact. Uh, now, what about plays that are original plays, say, that are not telling the same story? Even there, uh, and I think modern literary theory is, a, is an interesting place to go, bloom and post-bloom, the whole idea of the death of the author the concept of the death of the author is that no author is entirely original, that every new work is made up of bits and pieces and quotations of previous works. That's ghosting. That's what ghosting is.
And so when you, often when you see a, a, a new play, you may well think, oh well, yes, Moliere uses that same technique for Shakespeare or whatever, or Tennessee Williams. Uh, that authors, whether they admit it or not, are always borrowing ideas, techniques, strategies from other earlier writers. Uh, Moliere did this all the time, Shakespeare did this all the time. Uh, and that means that whenever you're doing that, as an audience, reading or watching the plays, the echoes of those, those other works also are potential ghostly material. I would like to ask you about stable companies. You, you may find it very interesting when you mention the Comedia dell'arte, yeah? stable companies with oh, the yes. same cast, with the same people, with the same actors, yes. and the same thing with Moliere, isn't it? That right, right. This yeah. will, no longer, will no longer be possible nowadays, is it? This will no longer be possible nowadays, this kind of having a stable company with five, ten actors throughout you know, the rest of their, you know, of their casting, you know. So you don't have, for example, not even in, the, in London or in New York, you don't have, for example, National Theater. You don't have the same company, the same actors. They change according to the production, isn't it? And I'm like, so this sort of thing has disappeared, hasn't it? Well, first, I have to say this hasn't disappeared. It, it is. It's not as it's not common now in in the United States or or in England, but uh, in many parts of the world uh, there are very stable companies. Usually, you, all, most countries have a national theater: Denmark, Hungary, Poland, uh, uh, Finland, Sweden have permanent yeah, companies that just like Moliere, mm -hmm. uh, that as the Comedy Francais used to be, uh -huh. and still is to some extent. I mean, there are there are associateurs at the Comedy that are there their whole life. So uh, now that's not, of course, as you know, that's not true of the National Theater. Uh, they bring in new actors all the time. So first of all, there are still a lot of, even in New York or in London, there are a few small companies, like the Wooster Group, that have the same actors year after year after year and play similar kind of roles. So that hasn't disappeared, but it's not, in, in these countries, it's not the main way of organizing things. So I think the second thing I would say is that even when you don't have a stable group, you still have each individual actor has memories associated with them. That is, you say, oh, well, this is a, a particular kind of actor. He or actress, they do certain kinds of things. I mean, again, ju uh, just as, let's say, somebody, uh, uh, say, say Armin in Shakespeare's company, played a certain kind of clown, uh -huh. uh, or Burbage, you know, all these things. Well, today, although in the United States or in England, we don't really have that kind of company, but we still have Burbage type actors mm -hmm. and always play that kind of role, or Armin type actors that play that kind of role. So even when the company disappears, the connection with a, an actor in a particular kind of role is still on the stage. Thank you. So, I'm uh, sorry, you mentioned Second one, well, oh, yeah. uh, it's very short uh, question. You mentioned Shakespeare, <clears throat> but Burbage was the, uh, the big star from beginning to end. Yeah. So he played Romeo, later on he was playing King Lear. So that's why he had a writer like Shakespeare writing for the company. You think so? Oh, yes, I think that uh, uh, the usual thing in theater history, in the Western theater history, is that actor, that authors write for particular actors and for particular okay. companies, just as Shakespeare did. And uh, uh, when when you study the history of their companies, like Shakespeare, you can often see just just as 
uh, Shakespeare's clowns changed when Armin took over. Mm -hmm. uh, you could see Shakespeare changing his style because yes. different actors are available. Um, but having said that, then you also have to realize that even though certain actors, a, a, a part is written for a certain actor, and that's often true, that if the play continues to be presented and continues to be revived, then other actors begin layering other ideas and interpretations onto that. So you have the author has a certain actor in mind, but the character keeps growing and changing as new actors add things to it. And I and I think any any good theater uh, author must know that. And they must know, well, uh, it, it would be foolish to say, well, I'm going to write a play that only Burbage can act in. I love you. I want to do that. Uh, I think, I think, I suppose that they are asking if uh, you have a, a character such as Medea or Antigone and uh, if that can uh, be forgotten by the, the actor when he performs and so he won't bring to the contemporary performance uh, 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 the memory of the actor, of the Medea or the or Timon. That's what I understood but I'm not very sure I understood. You mean, you mean the actor forgets? To, to forget what he, he brought of memory, if he can't act uh, uh, nowadays without all this uh, haunting of the past. Or I, I, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> but but uh, let, me, let me, okay, first, let me say first that what I am talking about, what I am describing in ghosting is not about the actor, but about the audience. Ghosting is, I'm talking about ghosting as part of reception theory. Now, uh, I have taught acting. I can, I, can, I can talk about that, but that's not what I've been talking about. I've been talking about reception, which is a, and the, it's a very different process than acting. Uh, and I, I, mean, I can speak for several hours about acting, but I won't. But let, let, me, let me just say that you, you can't forget memory. Memory is something you have. I know that, uh, I know actors, I've worked with actors who say, no, when I start, I want a I want complete slate. I don't want to remember anything. I don't want to... They're lying. Uh, you cannot get rid of your memory. Now, let me say I am biased. Uh, I was I was trained in the studio method, uh, which comes which is the American variation of Stanislavski. And in 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 the studio, memory is everything. Memory is essential. Memory is central. To, to the actor's process. You may not agree with that, but that's how I was trained. And, and so I am biased. But that memory is a totally different thing from ghosting. Uh, the, 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 uh, I, I, when, in, in terms of memory, that is, take, take Lee Strasberg's effective memory, which is the most famous example. In very simple terms, you say, all right, my character at this point needs to feel very unhappy. And so I go into my personal memory and try to find a moment, a sequence, a time, a situation where I felt something like that. And then I bring that up and, and by evoking that emotional memory in myself, I am therefore able, theoretically, to access that and use it in my, uh, in my acting. That's not ghosting, that's something else. 
Now, if you say, does an actor use ghosting? I would say, you, they can, but it's not a good idea. Because to me, a, a, an actor ghosting would be an actor trying to remember how an other actor did this role. And that's not a good idea. Uh, each actor has to find their own way into a role. And the process of ghosting is something that the audiences have to do, but actors should not do it. Please ask me about um, a performance. And a new, a new performance being re a remade, copying Stanislavski, uh, The Three Sisters. For another public who never saw the original Stanislavski, uh, Three Sisters, Como, how do the, the ghosting arrive to this audience, this audience who never saw the first, uh, the first uh, how do I say, staging of the, of the play? Uh, the three sisters of Chekhov have been uh, uh, staged by Stanislavski and now some, someone I don't know called Peter Stein has, has uh, remade a revival of the three sisters for another audience who never saw the first uh, performance. How the contemporary uh, audience uh, can receive this uh, performance? I think the, the uh, of course, old as I am, I didn't see the original Three Sisters. <laughs> but I have seen many, many, many productions of Three Sisters. And so when I, when I went to Peter Stein's production, which I saw in, in, uh, at the Bouffe du Nord in Paris, um, I brought with me, and most of the audience brought with them, no, I mean, I don't think anybody there had seen the original uh, production, <laughs> but they had all seen the three sisters in many different versions, many different languages, and they were, obviously, as they were watching Peter Stein's uh, version, they were, they were remembering things out of the other, uh, the other versions, but they were also remembering uh, other Peter Stein productions. Uh, first of all, in that theater, which is a very distinctive, useful theater, or, or very distinctive, uh, evocatory theater, you go into the Bouffe du Nord, you're in a, you're in a Peter Stein world. Uh, it, it's an old, decaying theater. Uh, it's, it's associated with productions of Peter Stein. The three, uh, the, 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 the Chekhov was uh, done in what I would call a Peter Stein style, uh, multinational. Uh, the main physical object was a uh, a rich curtain, a rich uh, uh, a rich Oriental rug that covered the whole stage. He, he used that. He used that in Shakespeare. He used that in the Mahabharata. Uh, I just saw. Three, no, last week I saw Peter Stein's newest production, Why in New York, and there was that same rug, that same rug that I, I, I well, maybe not the same one, but it looked exactly the same. Uh, so, so the, uh, uh, even though Peter Stein, uh, who is a wonderful director, of course, is very innovative and very original, he doesn't get away from ghosting. He loves ghosting and uses it all the time. Uh, so it is, it is even a matter of, of, of whether you've seen the original production or not. Ghosting works in so many different ways. Other productions are the same play, other productions by the same director, other productions by the same uh, actors. Uh, other productions using that same rug. Uh, that's all ghosting. And, and uh, Peter Stein uses it just like everybody else does. Enrique wants to know, uh, because he, he, he's a historian, he wants to know about memory, the memory, the theater. He, 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 he thinks your lecture was very interesting. But he also thinks about forgetting. And he thinks that uh, he heard, he has listened and, and, and read Beatrice Piconvalin uh, on the memory of Meyerhold. 
that has been uh, silent for some time and after that has been remembered. And so he wants to know about this temporality, uh, forgetting and memory, memory. The dynamic, the dynamic between the two. Wonderful question, a very big question. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, let me say that uh, memory and forgetting are, are part of the same process, obviously. We, we uh, people talk about selective memory. Uh, uh, we only remember certain things, we forget certain things, and, and uh, what we actually remember is part, partly shaped by what we forgot. So uh, that's, that's always a part of the, of the process. Um, I think that uh, uh, just as the theater is very much occupied with memory, it's also very much occupied with, with forgetting because uh, it is such an ephemeral temporary art. That is, you paint a painting, it's there. You publish a novel, it's there. You present a play and it's gone. And so forgetting becomes operating immediately in, in the theater and, and conditions all memory. So, uh, they, you cannot speak about memory without speaking about about forgetting. Um, if 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 you will allow, but but theater certainly has dramatists are always interested in writing about forgetting, uh, either conscious or unconscious forgetting. Um, uh, if every one of Ibsen's plays is about things that people are trying to forget. Um, and I, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll tell you about my favorite play about forgetting. Uh, the, um, uh, there, there is a, a, a group, an experimental theater group in New York called the Nature Theater of Oklahoma. It's a very interesting group. They're not from Oklahoma. Uh, the, the title comes from Kafka, actually. Uh, it, it's a chapter in his, his novel about America. But anyway, the, nature, the first play the Nature Theater of Oklahoma did was called Romeo and Juliet. And how they made this play was they telephoned 10 of their friends and, and recorded the telephone and said, Tell me what you remember about the story of Romeo and Juliet. And then they recorded this. And then they put these recordings together and did that as a play. So it really is a play about forgetting. People are, and, and, and it's full of people will say, okay, now there are these two families. Uh, one of them I think is called the um, Morrison's or something. <laughs> uh, and the whole play is like that. It's very, very funny. It's it's what it's both what you what everybody remembers about Romeo and Juliet and also what everybody has forgotten about Romeo and Juliet. Um, so it, it it's it's a, a it, in a way it's almost a parody of plays that are made out of documents. That this is kind of a an anti document. So uh, there are many other uh, there are many other plays uh, uh, not like that, but but uh, forgetting and the process of forgetting and the dynamics of it is certainly something that the theater has always been very much occupied. With. I I should mention that uh, I, I already mentioned that right now in New York, uh, Peter Brook's newest uh, uh, play is uh, called Why is performing. And in one sequence in that production, there is a discussion of Meyer Holt, and what they are discussing is uh, Meyer Holt's political career and also the process of trying to erase Meyer Holt's memory. So it deals directly with the with the question of forgetting and of Meyer Holt. So you you might want to look look up that that production too.